Well, let's start off with a happy holidays to everyone out there that uh, is in their particular holiday season. Not much of a week coming up. We have a very shortened week. Some countries' markets are closed for two days, Monday uh, and Tuesday. U.S. is open for four days, and then it goes into the New Year's long weekend. There's nothing, nothing happens between Christmas and New Year's. Most of the tax selling, uh, tax loss harvesting, I should say, is done. There are no earnings. Companies don't report earnings. There's almost no economic data. Uh, it is just uh, drifting into the end of the year. Uh, and it is quite common that many uh, um, asset managers do take time off during this period of time, that any significant positioning that needed to be done has been done. So if it ends up being a boring week with low volume and the market hardly moving, uh, that's, that's quite normal. Usually the last week drifts in the direction that December has drifted in. Uh, since December has drifted up, usually it drifts up during that time. If somebody wanted to sell, they would have already sold before, uh, before the end of the year to lock in any tax losses. So there's usually a lack of selling. So it usually drifts up in the direction that we came. Certainly not shoots up, but drifts up in that direction. With light volume though, uh, any buying could actually result in, in some big up days, but be careful of those big up days on light volume. Anyways, let's have a look at the week that was. Uh, Treasury uh, rates um, well behaved again in the money market rates, except the one year is getting aggressive, another 13 basis points there. Again, on the two year, when you get out to the longer end of the curve, the five year onwards, uh, hardly any activity going on week over week. We now have four key rates uh, that appear to look uh, uh, to end the year, end 2023, lower than when they started 2023. And we have the 10 year, just two more basis points on the 10 year, and it will end 2023 lower than it started 2023, even with rate hikes. Looking at our inversions, you should see over time, if this continues on, an uninversion of the capital market curves. And you can see that most of them have uninverted. Capital market curves are the two year out to the 30 year. Uh, but the uh, money market to capital market inversion should get deeper because the three month will reflect Fed policy only, the overnight rate. Uh, whereas the 10 year will start to uh, price in um, cuts, uh, lower inflation, lower growth, so we should expect deeper inversions in here before it gets better. 154 points. Started the year at 54. We can see for the capital market curves, all of them uh, are um, less inverted than when they started the year. Uh, negative 53 to negative 41, negative 11 to 3. Whereas uh, the, uh, cap the money market, the capital market is more inverted because the three-month won't budge until the Fed budges. But the 10-year, well, that's the market. Canada even worse at 183.6. Balance sheet runoff from the SOMA, uh, 20.77 billion, down to 7.124 trillion. Probably going to see a six handle sometime before the end of February. Balance sheet uh, is increasing 7.72. That's a drop of 15.5. So what am I saying? It's increasing. Uh, the runoff here was 20.77. So the net was an increase outside of the uh, runoff of the uh, QE securities and that increase of 5.27 billion. Money market fund assets decreased 16.09 billion, but uh, retail still, uh, still slow on the uptake, increased uh, by 10 billion, both in government and prime. It is institutions uh, that are the movers here, down 26 uh, billion with uh, 33 billion coming out of government and uh, almost 7 billion increase uh, in prime. Next Fed meeting, January 31st, 38 days away. We're 10 days away from the FOMC minutes. We'll get it the first week back after New Year's on the uh, Wednesday. Tuesday, not much going on this week. Tuesday, a two-year auction. Wednesday, a five-year auction. Thursday, a seven-year auction. No Fed speak, no significant economic data. 
probabilities at uh, January 25 basis point cut is now up to 14 and a half percent I think that is premature I, uh, I just don't see it in there it was 10.3 last week going in the wrong direction I think uh, January is going to be uh, a zero 85.5 percent on the zero down from 89 looking out to the end of uh, the first half we'll include the June uh, so we include the June meeting here. The Fed, Fed, I say the end of the first half because Fed fund futures uh, are as of June 30th. So when we're looking at the probabilities, uh, these are based on the index value as of June 30th because that's, that's the closing of trade, which will include the June 12th FOMC. So we're clean on this one. What I've done is I've divided them uh, based on what the Fed is saying, three rate cuts. So is what you know? What probability is the market pricing in three or more? Ninety percent. So ninety percent for three or more. Uh, the Fed is at three, and we can see that we have almost uh, twenty-four percent of that on four or more. Uh, last week it was fifty-three point seven, eighty-nine point eight. Uh, only ten point two percent probability of uh, only two rate cuts or less versus forty-six point three. Uh, effective federal funds rate 5.33 reverse repo up 89 billion but we are going into the end of the month and the end of the quarter uh, so usually positioning uh, on balance sheets uh, um, would indicate a rise in cash so there's usually especially at the end of the quarter a rise in uh, a rise in the balance here so by the end of next week, I'd expect that to, to be up again. And then once we get into January, start to decrease again. The lag, 100 basis points. Real rates, uh, all well behaved over the last week. We now have a flat term structure from the 5 to the 10. So it had been inverted for quite some time. It is now a flat structure. Uh, and then past the 10 to the 20 to the 30, you are now upward sloping past that. So we don't have an inverted real yield curve anymore. Uh, inflation, uh, break-even rates, all well behaved as well. Looking at Fed funds futures, uh, no, no real change here for January. Um, 5.33 was the implied rate, 5.325, uh, call that nothing. Going out to the end of June, 4.79 implied, now 4.64, 15 basis point, another 15 basis points lower. So the drop between the end of January to the end of June, 68.5, that's almost three rate cuts uh, between the end of January, uh, uh, January 31st, and all the way to the end of June, three. I think that is wrong. I think that is way too aggressive that a, a good uh, or I think an interesting trade here barring of course any exogenous events but a good trade here would probably uh, be to sell the June uh, Fed funds futures at 9521 if it's pricing in three rate cuts by the uh, by in the first half of the year I think that's wrong uh, going from the end of June to the end of September pricing in almost two rate cuts in there uh, so you're at five rate cuts and you're not even at the end of December yet. By the time we get to the end of December, uh, using the uh, one month SOFR as a proxy, 164 basis points. That's six to seven rate cuts next year. The Fed's got three penciled in. I think that's wrong. Uh, again, that's, that's assuming that there is no exogenous event or that there isn't a uh, really fast uh, uh, um, deterioration of inflation which turns to deflation very quickly and very fast there that yeah then you could see six or seven if there was a sharp rise in unemployment and a big drop off in uh, inflation you could see that but you are looking for that event you're looking for the hard landing then yes you're six to seven if you're in the soft landing camp that sounds like a little too much now all year long the economy just kept performing when you have unemployment below 4%, I just don't, unless you get unemployment up, I can't see a hard landing. As long as unemployment stays here, you give consumers money, consumers will go spend that money, period. End of story. Nothing to discuss here. The consumer will not pull back. They will keep spending the money you give them, period. 
that is the more the American consumer than almost any other consumer uh, has probably the highest marginal propensity to consume. Uh, so you will not, I think, get a drop in demand uh, from the consumer unless you actually separate them from their paychecks. That's the only way. Uh, so if you start seeing unemployment go up, then yeah, this may be depending on the speed at which it goes up. But I think this is wrong. If uh, you know the economy has continued to defy expectations and just keep performing. So if it continues to do that, then this is wrong. By the end of Q2, two to three rate cuts. I think uh, I, I, versus uh, uh, December and June, if I, had to, if I had to take a short on the Fed funds futures, I'd be saying June because uh, 68.5 is simply just too many. It's just too much. Q344, call that two. Q4, 51.5, two. You're looking at six to seven rate cuts. The Fed speak in January will be interesting. And I think the press conference, if this, if this is still priced into the curve by January, uh, I think the press conference will be uh, maybe a little confrontational with uh, Powell versus the market. If it keeps this in, there's going to be a question. Somebody somewhere is going to say the market is currently pricing in six to seven cuts. You've got three. Are they wrong? In January, we don't get any new dot plot. We get no new summary of, uh, 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 of economic projection. So we're not going to see if their thinking has changed over time towards the market. TLT. Uh, going sideways, it was a good run. It was a good run. It's healthy after a good run to have a period of consolidation uh, just, just so that you can build a firm base of, of, of ownership on which you can then uh, get your next leg higher. Uh, continuing on higher and higher just would have been unhealthy because the correction would have been sharper. If we can consolidate here over a couple of weeks, I think we set up to go higher. Uh, down 0.68. That's not selling. That's just saying, you know what? This is good. Uh, it's new buyers coming in that are like, mm, I'm a little hesitant to, after the big run that you've had. It's, it's, it's owners or, or, or uh, long positions saying, uh, you know, let's take a bit of profit here. But for the most part saying, no, the rate cuts are coming. This is the right place to be. It's about time in the market. So it's about waiting. Uh, had trouble at 100 Tried a couple times uh, the 99, 75 to 100 range. Uh, tried to hit the 100 uh, mark a few times and uh, and failed. Looked like it was going to have some kind of day here, but uh, didn't. S&P uh, up 0.75%. IVP on TLT falling uh, very quickly while with a nice tight range in here. Uh, less than a dollar fifty range here all week long, yeah. 26% on the 13 week down to 2%. I've made no changes. My uh, January $100 calls that I sold are now in gains. Uh, they are profitable at this point. Uh, thank you, uh, Friday. And with Friday, uh, you get three days of theta coming out. You have Saturday, Sunday, and Monday coming out. Next week, there's only four days. I don't know if it breaks 100. If it doesn't, uh, then four days, four more days will gone, and it'll price out another three days on the weekend. So uh, that one is working out nicely. And you can see the green line down here, uh, denoting that my position is now in gains. Big move in mortgages last week, 6.67 down, 28 basis points in one week. Full rate cut right there. 10-year U.S. Treasury only down one basis point, so the spread uh, contracted 27 basis points, which is almost 10% contraction, down to 277 basis points. Didn't really help the housing stocks very much, kind of mixed in there, uh, even on the back of some pretty big price target increases. I think Toll Brothers price target increase 150, and I forget the name of the firm that did it, but it was a significant name. It's not like one of these you know, little small names that you, you know, that release price updates, you know, 50 in a week. You know they're doing it uh, uh, quantitatively, that no one's really paying much attention there. But it was a significant firm. All, all price target increases. I think that makes sense. You have structural shortage for quite some time. Uh, mortgage REITs, 
benefited from the uh, contracting spread. Now, what's going to be interesting is as rates start to get cut, as the mortgage rates increase their leverage, most of them are sitting between, I think, seven and eight times leverage, and they go up to about 11 to 12 times leverage. So as they increase their leverage, as rates start getting cut from seven to eight to 11 to 12, that means they just got to buy more stuff. Uh, and if they buy more stuff, that will, um, uh, being the, the mortgage market is not really that robust right now. There's still mortgages out there, but it's certainly not a big supply of MBS coming onto the market. That should contract that spread uh, nice and quickly. ABR, 2.47 week over week. It uh, had a little bit of selling on Friday, but not much. And if you looked at the news feed, you would have seen that there's four or five of the usual suspect law firms in opening an investigation on ABR. Anytime a stock takes a big drop or anytime there's a short report, you get these, these I'm going to call them ambulance chasing law firms that jump in and say, oh, we're going to investigate for a class action lawsuit. Make sure nothing went wrong. If you suffered a loss, please contact us. Um, but I read the 10Ks and 10Qs of these companies, and here's the funny thing. I never see these law firm names under legal matters, which means they never actually file suit. They threaten to file suit, but they never actually file suit. So, you know, I know lawyers, billable hours, billable hours, bill, it's all about billable hours. Where are the billable hours here? If you never actually file suit, who's paying for this? Is it all the people that are coming in, that I lost money, I lost money, I lost, and you're saying, well, okay, if everyone gives us a thousand bucks, we'll have enough to conduct the research phase of our lawsuit. It, do they try to get money that way? Um, I don't know. It seems like it's a kind of a risky way to get money because unless you're actually reading that newsfeed or have some way of, of, uh, uh, of getting this information, you're not going to know to contact this law firm right now. So it must be something else. And I think, well, okay, we know Viceroy is a, uh, uh, a pump, uh, sorry, a short and distort uh, research firm. They get paid by hedge funds to put out reports specifically, and the reports don't have to be true, they're generally not, but specifically to push the price down. Well, are there not law firms like that? Could a hedge fund not say to a law firm, listen, I don't actually need you to do any work. I just need you to make an announcement. Here's 10 grand. Announce that you're investigating this company for, for securities fraud. Just make an announcement. And it could be that these ambulance chasers are nothing more than these, you know, shitty little research firms. Because it's always the same names. It's always the same suspects. And I never see in any of the companies they're doing this to you go to the legal matters they're never there so they threaten the file suit but they never file suit so i think they're in on it i think they're in on it you know it just fits the data really well anyways our abr up 2.47 percent uh corporate spreads here oh yes uh, IG, big story there last week breached 100 basis points was under 100 Saw a, 90, saw a 90 handle, 99, 98, I think, before it came back up to 107. Look at triple C. Triple C, the worst uh, uh, place to be, uh, actually was the, best, uh, was the best performer this week in terms of being, uh, uh, of contracting, negative 3.32. Uh, the other contraction here was on high yield, uh, um, 341, 341. The CDS high yield is 500. That is that is the um, the basic um, basis point, the base the basic premium on it. And then of course your CDS would be priced at a discount or a premium based on the 500. But 500 is kind of sort of the benchmark uh, premium. This is 341. Let's look at some data from last week. Mortgage apps down 1.5 percent. You're coming into the end of the year. Uh, I don't expect to see this tick up until you get into, you know, January, February. The spring season will be interesting for mortgage apps. Housing market index, 37, uh, up from 34 uh, for December. Building permits for November were down 2.5%. Housing starts up 14.8%. That's incredible. 14.8% on starts. Existing home sales. 
for November, up 0.8. New home sales for November, down 12.2%. Uh, was down 4% uh, the month before. This week, we do get a little bit of housing data. The house pricing is really backwards looking, though. House price index for October, Case Shiller uh, as well on Tuesday for October, and pending home sales for November. Okay, let's do some uh, central bank analysis here. Bank of Canada versus the Fed in the final Royal Rumble here. Who is going to cut rates first? And um, let's leave all forecasts of the economy out of it. Let's just think about the mind of the people uh, and who is most likely based on, based on today. Cater is paribus, nothing changes. Who's going to be the first to cut? My money's on Bank of Canada. Even though the inflation uh, data didn't come in uh, very friendly, I think Bank of Canada cuts first. Core inflation rate, month over month, we got this uh, last week, 0.1 on core. This is core and it's month over month, 0.1. Previous was 0.3, that's good. Year over year for core, uh, 2.8. Last reading was 2.7, actually ticked up, that's not good. Inflation rate, this is headline, year over year, 3.1 unchanged. Forecast was for a drop to 2.9, it's unchanged. Inflation rate month over month unchanged. Forecast was for uh, a deflationary month over month read. The median CPI year over year unchanged was uh, forecast for a drop. The trimmed mean year over year unchanged. Forecast was for uh, a drop. PPI though is in outright deflation. Uh, the PPI month over month is negative 0.4, year over year negative 2.3. So you can have a negative month which is deflationary but an inflationary year which means the deflationary month is only disinflationary. But this is actual deflation in PPI readings. The raw materials price month over month negative 4.2, worse than the 3.5 and uh, year over year negative 4.6. Um, Tiff Macklem uh, said uh, that he does expect to start cutting rates next year uh, in the second half of the year. Mm. I sort of think he'll have to bring that up uh, a little bit. Here's his statement up here. Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem said he expects to start cutting interest rates next year but needs to see several months of sustained downward momentum in core inflation first. There's your core inflation. Uh, came in at 0.1 instead of 0.3. However, uh, if we're looking at it year over year, that went in the wrong direction. So we sort of have some mixed data here. However, this is indicating that if this flows through to final demand for consumers, uh, into the CPI, then we are expecting some significant deflationary uh, um, uh, tailwinds to come into next year. The Fed, on the other hand, has uh, three rate cuts that they're saying. Now, uh, Macklem didn't say how many rate cuts. He just says, I need to see several months of sustained downward momentum. Well, we could ask what downward momentum means to him. Is it 0.1 per month? Is that momentum? Uh, or is it 0.2 or 0.3 year over year per month? What is momentum? Don't know. Let's look at the Fed. Williams, uh, this was the week before. Uh, we aren't really talking about rate cuts. Uh, he's saying that, that uh, any discussion is premature. The New York Fed is uh, sort of the more important voice out there. A little premature. Bostick, uh, no urgency. He sees uh, two cuts in the second half plus a soft landing. Not three. He sees only two. Chicago, Goolsby, he's confused by the market response. However, in uh, an interview in the Wall Street Journal, may soon need to cut, uh, uh, soon need cuts uh, for Mandate 2. Uh, mandate 2 meaning uh, uh, full employment. And so he said we may soon need to uh, implement some cuts uh, to support full employment. Mester from Cleveland, uh, market is too far ahead. The next phase is not about cuts, but about how long to stay on hold. Well, I think everyone gets that. They, they are in phase two now, is how long do we stay on hold? Uh, you guys have said you're going to cut three times. You guys have been wrong the whole way through. You guys were slow to start, and you may be slow to cut. So the market is, the market was ahead of you the whole time. The market's ahead of you now. I mean, that's one side of the argument. 
uh, but they do have to put they do have to say this they do have to push back on the market because you can't have real rates get cut too fast because you could risk inflationary pressure showing up again so you can't risk that what what the fed is saying is that hey guys everything is good right now if we if we stay here for a bit longer we should all be okay but if you go all running for the exits you'll screw everything up so they kind of have to say look the doors are locked stand still so i don't know whether they're saying this as part of their strategy or if this is what they truly believe uh, but I think, uh, I think you know, it had to be said. There had to be some pushback to slow down those real rates. Look at the Canadian dollar. What, what, what did I say I was hoping for? Looks like I'm getting a Christmas gift. Thank you, universe. You, you, you've treated me like crap all year long, and you think this small gift is going to make up for it? Oh, you got a lot of making up to do. Um, the low, the one-year low on the uh, exchange rate, 131.095. Uh, we're sitting at 132.585, about 150 pips above the low. And we've come down 600 pips in six weeks. 600 pips in six weeks. And I had to change my Canadian to U.S. So this, this move here amounts to an extra 32,700 U.S. for every million in Canadian I exchange. Uh, I just made an extra, just, just with that move alone, just because I have to exchange my Canadian for U.S., I basically just made, at the end of the year, another 33 k per million that I exchange. Thank you, universe. We're still not even, right? I'm, I haven't forgiven you for beta, but, you know, okay, so duration was good, and this was good. We're, we're almost even. I don't hate you, but you owe me. Let's uh, read uh, the Bank of Canada uh, deliberations. They don't have minutes. It's called deliberations, but we'll read that. It's super short. It's nothing like the Fed minutes, which goes on for 11 pages. It's super short. But the insight that you get from this is incredible. So this was released uh, December 20th. It's the summary of Governing Council deliberations. And uh, we can skip uh, that part till we get to the Canadian economy. It's really not long. Uh, and there's considerations for monetary policy. There's the decision, and uh, that's the end of it. So we don't have to go through much here. But you'll, uh, I think you'll be amazed at the uh, insight that you can get from this. Governing Council reviewed developments in the Canadian economy and the dynamics of inflation since October. Canada's economic growth had essentially stalled in the middle quarters of 2023. National accounts data for the third quarter showed economic growth had contracted at a rate of 1.1% after expanding at a rate of 1.4% in the second quarter. Slowdown was largely due to consumption, which had been flat over the second and third quarters. Higher interest rates continued to restrain consumer spending on many goods and services. Business investment had also been flat over the past four quarters, albeit with more volatility. Well, that's true. Of all the components of GDP, business investment is the most volatile. Government spending and residential construction contributed positively to growth. There's a shock. Government spending contributed to growth? Government spending is all growth. I mean, all, or I should say all the growth is government spending, especially in Canada. There's just, they just don't seem to understand uh, a, a credit card limit. It seems to me that these are the, the kids of the parents who always exceeded their credit card limit in university and the parents kept saying you got to stop spending money you know uh, residential construction contributed positively to growth in the third quarter as a result final domestic demand grew by 1.3 percent in each of the last two quarters now here's the thing government spending is more than 1.3 percent of gdp so if you remove government spending uh, it's not good at all uh, governing council members noted that part of the third quarter increase in government spending was in response to wildfires and was therefore expected to be temporary. Housing activity rose by 8.3% in the third quarter, largely because of an increase in new home construction. Members commented that while it was encouraging to see spending on the construction of new homes and apartments, a this is important here, 
a significant and sustained increase in new home construction would be needed to resolve the long-standing structural shortage in supply. Look at those, look at those adjectives. Significant, sustained increase in new home construction to resolve the long-standing structural shortage in supply. You got to be in apartment REITs. We have no publicly traded national home builder, not even regional home builders. We have nothing like that, like, the, like we have in the U.S., a nice, beautiful market in the U.S. for home builders. Here, we don't, at least none that I'm aware of. And I don't want to go into the building materials because that could be subject to its own supply and demand dynamics. You could say, well, timber, you're going to need timber to build houses. Hey, if you can build houses, that's the problem right now. If you can build houses, and what if there's a big supply of timber and timber prices fall? Well, that still doesn't change the housing dynamics, so I don't want to go into the supplies of it. The closest trade to this right now are the apartment REITs, uh, because where, where are you going to go? Our Canada third quarter immigration was the second highest quarterly immigration number on record in the history of the country. The Liberals are desperate to win the next election. Yeah, they have to import the votes to get it done. Immigrants tend to vote Liberal. They tend to vote Liberal. They know that, so they're importing as many votes as they possibly can. There's no place to live. There's no room at the inn. you got to be somewhere. So, uh, you know. Members turn to a discussion of the labor market. Data from the most recent labor force survey pointed to continued easing. The slowing economy had brought job vacancies down to close to the pre-pandemic trend. Job growth continued to rise more slowly than the pace implied by population growth. Well, <laughs> our population growth is, is the highest of the G7. That's, that's not a surprising. I wouldn't even had to look at the numbers to tell you that job growth is not going to keep pace with population growth. Not, not at the numbers that, that Canada is producing. Uh, let's see. And the unemployment rate picked up slightly in November to 5.8%. However, members noted that wage growth remained elevated uh, within a 4 to 5% range. Wage growth in the private sector had eased since the start of the year, whereas public sector wage growth had risen. Well, private sector is business, and public sector is government. You're telling me governments are spending more, more taxpayer dollars? Oh, there's a shock. There's a shock. Initial indicators for the fourth quarter suggested economic growth would remain weak as higher interest rates continue to hold back spending. With a range of indicators suggesting the economy was approaching balance in the third quarter and with growth expected to be weak in the fourth quarter, members concluded the economy was no longer in excess demand. If you're no longer in excess demand, you don't need higher interest rates. The question now is, what's more important? Waiting for inflation to come down or uh, saving an economy that appears to be, uh, well, flatlining. And if you remove government spending, certainly with their head underwater. Governing Council reviewed recent data on inflation. Uh, CPI inflation eased to 3.1% in October from 3.8% in September. While the drop largely reflected lower gasoline prices, the evidence was clear that higher interest rates had reduced price pressures on a broadening range of goods and services. The share of CPI components growing above 3% and 5% year over year continued to tick down in October. Notably, many durable goods saw price declines in October, while services price inflation, excluding shelter, was lower than the year earlier. We'll get into some shelter stuff here. This will, this, this, you sort of just cements the case for apartment REITs here. Members discussed at length the acceleration of shelter price inflation, which rose at a rate of 6.1% in October. Oh, this, is, this blows my mind here. And contributed 1.8 percentage points to the total CPI reading of 3.1. Take shelter out, you've got a 1.3% inflation read for October. 1.3% contributed 1.8 percentage points to the total of 3.1. Just let that sit in for a minute. 1.3% is way below the 2% target. And you've already said there is a massive structural shortage of housing. And we must agree that the pace of immigration is off the charts. 
So we don't have inflation. Uh, we have we have lower inflation than is necessary, which calls for lower which calls for lower rates almost immediately. So I think I think uh, the Bank of Canada would be the first to move because they cannot affect the supply of housing. Let's keep reading here. Higher mortgage interest costs were clearly playing a role in shelter price inflation. However, rent and other components linked to house prices, such as insurance, taxes, and maintenance, also grew strongly, which is unusual. For example, rent inflation was 8.2% in October, a 40-year high. Okay, think about that. Rent inflation, 8.2% in October, 40-year high. We go back up here, uh, and we're talking about... Uh, 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 a significant and sustained increase in new home construction would be needed to resolve the long-standing structural shortage in supply. You got rent inflation at a 40-year high. You got immigration uh, at, at um, heck, I'd say, all-time highs. Uh, uh, something has to give. Uh, you got to be in apartment REITs, I think. Governing Council members noted that higher interest rates were restraining demand for housing but the structural shortage of supply was supporting elevated house prices. In other words, there's nothing they can do about this. There's nothing they can do about it. Higher interest rates were restricting demand for housing, but the structural shortage of supply was supporting elevated house prices. They're talking about a shelter rising at 6.1%, making up 1.8 of the 3.1%. Ignoring housing, we got 1.3% inflation, and the Liberals will not stop importing votes. They're not going to stop. No matter how high interest rates go, they're not going to stop. It's about power. It's not about the Canadian uh, 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 household. It's about Brand Trudeau, period. You know that most of the people in his party want him to leave. He, and he said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not done yet. I'm not done destroying this country for my particular brand yet. In many ways, he's very much like Trump. Very much like Trump. Overall, core measures of inflation had remained in the 3.5 to 4% range, but had edged down to the lower end of that range in October. On a three-month annualized basis, core inflation dropped to about 3%. Considerations. <clears throat> Governing Council members agree that past increases in policy interest rate were continuing to feed through the economy, slowing spending and relieving price pressures. With data indicating continued slow growth in the fourth quarter, their outlook for the economy was broadly in line with the October projection. Members anticipated that weakness in consumption and business investment would continue for the next two to three quarters. With the economy no longer in excess demand, members agreed they would be watching for signs that the slowdown in the economy was translating into further and sustained easing in inflation. So I think that sometime near the end of March, they'll be ready to say, we got to do something. And I think they will move before the Fed moves. That's uh, sort of my bet. However, the Canadian dollar is suggesting the opposite. So as long as the market continues to think that the Bank of Canada will be the last to move and that the Fed will move first, it gives me time to uh, translate all of my Canadian into U.S. <clears throat> Getting it into interactive brokers to exchange it at spot is super slow because of the limits of how much you could transfer each day. So you got to transfer just every day I'm transferring. Every day, every day. It's going to take me 28 days to get this done. Uh, so I'm hoping that for the next month, the market is under this illusion. They don't read too carefully, and they're under this illusion that the Bank of Canada is hawkish while the Fed is dovish. I hope they, I, I hope they keep that going. Uh, at their October meeting, members had expressed concern uh, that measured uh, on a three-month annualized basis, core inflation uh, had remained stuck in a 35 to 4% for almost a year with little downward momentum. At their December meetings, members viewed the drop in core measures uh, in the more recently published October CBI as a positive sign. However, they agreed that one month of inflation data was not enough to give them confidence. That inflation would continue to trend down to 2% in a sustainable way. You know, I, you just set it up here. I don't, I don't know why they're not taking this out. You've said that it contributed 1.8 to the 3.1, and you're saying here that, that the structural shortage of supply was supporting elevated house prices, and you know monetary policy can't touch that. I don't know what there is to deliberate here. I don't know why they just don't come right out and say it. Unless you build more homes, uh, the measure of inflation will stay here, 
but the measure of inflation for everything else is is getting dangerously low. I don't know why you just don't say it. Uh, members discussed other indicators they've been watching to assess the path of underlying inflation. <clears throat> Wages continue to grow within a 4 to 5% range. If this were to continue, uh, it would not be consistent with achieving price stability, particularly given weak productivity. That is a problem in Canada. It has always been a problem in Canada. There have been papers written about it. In fact, you can Google Productivity Conundrum Canada and look at the hits you're going to get. We have always had a productivity problem given uh, particularly weak uh, productivity. No new survey information <clears throat> had been released on either corporate pricing behavior or near-term inflation expectations of consumers and businesses. Members said they wanted to see more evidence that these indicators were trending in a direction that is consistent with price stability. Almost done here. Uh, Governing Council members also expressed concern that shelter price inflation could remain elevated and that this could make it more difficult to return inflation at 2%. <clears throat> Okay, we're getting somewhere here. Some members expressed the view that costs related to house prices would ease as higher interest rates continue to retain spending and weigh on the housing market. Others were concerned that elevated shelter price inflation could persist or even accelerate, given that it will take time for supply to catch up with demand. Members noted that if financial conditions eased prematurely, the housing market could rebound, further fueling shelter price pressures. They agreed that monetary policy could not solve the structural shortage of supply in the housing market. Great. Look at that. They agree. Monetary policy could not solve the structural shortage of supply in the housing market. So let's put this all together. Housing uh, is the cause of the inflation read above 2% right now. Uh, and they agree that nothing they can do is going to solve that shortage. And they must, they're not going to criticize the government, but they must be aware of the elevated immig immigration rates. And they must be saying, we can either destroy every Canadian household or just, just say, look, let's start looking at inflation less housing. Housing is a problem. It's okay to have inflation in, in a sector. If only one sector of the economy were showing inflation, that is not a general increase in the price index. So when we say we have inflation, it's because it is a broad, general increase. Housing is a specific increase. They can look past housing, and I think they will. Uh, let's see. Where do we leave off here? Um, they agreed that monetary policy could not solve the structural shortage of supply in the housing market. Members said they would continue to monitor closely the evolution of shelter price inflation and its contribution the core inflation and total CPI. So I read that last part as a willingness. They will review the evolution of shelter price inflation and its contribution to core and total. I see that as a willingness at some point to say, look, we can't fix this problem. We're going we're gonna to break everything in the store for this one thing. And really, it is a sector story, not a general economy story. Housing is a sector story. Maybe they're willing to let that go, and I think they are. Overall, Gov Governing Council members concluded that recent data pointed in the right direction. But with considerable uncertainty surrounding the outlook for inflation, they agreed that risks remain elevated. They saw two broad types of risks. The expected decline in inflation could stall, with inflation still material above 2%, or new developments could lead to renewed inflationary pressures. So their two risks are inflation will stall or it'll go higher. Uh, it's interesting that they don't they don't talk about uh, the the economy and the labor market. But in their defense, this is not a dual mandate central bank. The Fed is a dual mandate central bank. The ECB is a single mandate. The Bank of Canada is a single mandate price stability. Period. Uh, so that they don't mention uh, too much about the other risk being the economy is in line with uh, their single mandate. In this context, Governing Council needed to remain vigilant. And then the next part was, look, we're, gonna, we're just going to stay on hold. OK, let's turn to the Fed. We had some uh, information out this week on GDP uh, and PCE. We also had durable goods. The durable goods came in uh, pretty good. But we'll take a closer look at the report. Let's look at uh, leading index, negative again. Now, this is important to understand because we do seem to have this 
uh, argument on both sides. Uh, look at, uh, where are we here, for GDP, 4.9. Yeah, it came down from the 5.2. It was 4.9. Our second look was 5.2. Our final, because you get three looks at it, is 4.9. That is, uh, that's real, real. That's not nominal. It's a pretty healthy economy. However, we have never had an inversion of the three-month to 10-year curve uh, for the length of time that we've had. And for the depth that we've had, we're, what, 100, uh, 150 plus points uh, inverted, uh, and it's been well over a year. Never has the economy escaped a recession. Never. Never have the leading indicators been negative for so many months in a row and down to the level that they were that we've, that we've escaped a recession. Never. So if we escape a recession, we're setting history, with leading economic uh, index, we're setting history uh, with the money market, the capital market inversion. However, we can't argue with GDP. 4.9, unless there is some anomaly, because these are statistical measures. GDP we, is not counted. It doesn't go around and, and count everything that there is. So it's our best guess based on the distribution uh, that we would expect to find based on you know the best sampling techniques we have. And the theory is, well, okay, so there is sampling error, but if you take, if you follow the same procedures at regular intervals, at regular intervals, you might not be measuring what you're measuring uh, quite correctly, that there may be a lot of sampling error in here. But if you measure it the same way each time, what you can get is consistency between the measures. You can tell when the measure has gone up or when the measure has gone down. That is the idea behind it. Well, you got a pandemic in there. Is there something with the sampling technique that is now introducing even more sampling error? Yeah, it's a possibility, right? Because you have some indicators that seem to be have great 100% track records, uh, yet the economy just keeps saying, nope, not us. It's very odd. Anyways, uh, we're going to find out. Uh, I can say, in 2024, we're going to find out. Last year at this time, I said, 2023, we're going to find out. Something's going to happen. Nothing happened. Nothing happened, which is the something. The something that happened was nothing. Let's see if uh, 2024 is any better. Um, as far as inflation goes, I really do think uh, the Fed has got its job done. Uh, and that the bigger threat underlying uh, all economies, I think, globally, except those that are not integrated, those economies that want to be segmented. In other words, they, they haven't fully uh, integrated into the world economy. They have capital controls, perhaps. They have currency controls. Uh, maybe they'll go their own way. But we live in a deflationary world. Uh, and with uh, pre predictive analytics, where they happen to be and some predictive analytics, which is really good regression, which has been around for a long time, the upper end of the, uh, of the elegance of predictive analytics could be called the lower end of predictive AI. There is a slight nuance where they are different, that, but, but orders of magnitude different in their outcome, that if there is something there, that will be deflationary. Uh, technology has always been deflationary, and I do think that technology is not going to slow down. It's, it's permeating more and more parts of our lives. More and more of the things we buy have technology embedded in it. It is deflationary. That that uh, uh, the deflationary uh, aspect will be the thing I think that dominates the next the next uh, uh, growth cycle uh, or the next four, five, six years will be the fight against deflation. Look at core prices here. Uh, for the quarter, core PCE, uh, this is a price index for the, uh, for the C part of GDP, the consumption part, 2% core, previous 3.7, the forecast was 2.3, it's 2, 2. Uh, corporate profits, 3.7, came down from 4.1. You're starting to see some squeeze on corporate profits down at 3.7. So if we're trying to construct a short-term forecast, for 2024 on the expected return. And we want to use Grinnell Kroner, you have your dividend yield, you have roughly, uh, call it a stock buyback of about 1%. And if we think, well, 3.7%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%, 1.5%,
on the change in earnings. All we're left with is the percentage change in the PE. Uh, so you're what, 2.85, 6.5% here, 6.5. And if the PE holds constant, and we'll see that the PE ratio has gone up again, if it holds constant, uh, you're looking at a 6.5 possible return. Uh, where one year, uh, one year uh, money markets are yielding just under 5% right now. Uh, and that's with no risk. This is with risk. What if you get a contraction in the PE from almost, you know, 20 and a half now down to 19? 10% contraction in the PE or a 5% contraction could wipe out 2024. But that was not a, you know, coming in above 4.1 would have been better. Now for 2024, if... AI is going to show some promise. You know, it's been a good eight, nine months now since ChatGPT changed the the uh, the narrative of the market. We should start to see some of this show up somewhere uh, on income statements in 2024. Uh, Philly Fed, negative 10.5. Previous was negative 5.9. So downward, uh, uh, downward acceleration. Um, look at the leading indexes uh, within the Philly Fed. Uh, CapEx, uh, negative 7.5 versus negative 1.3. Now, CapEx, if you reduce CapEx, you increase your free cash flow. Uh, but you reduce uh, the basis for future growth. It's a trade-off, right? You don't have to reinvest anything in your business and you'll have strong free cash flow, but not for long. Uh, because you will exhaust your current business model, you'll exhaust your current assets. So you have to have CapEx, not only just to replace your assets, uh, but to grow your assets. Well, you pull back on CapEx, you pull back on the basis for future growth. Employment, negative 1.7 versus 0.8, that is in contraction, the, or the plan uh, is in contraction. This is the big one, Philly Fed new orders, negative 25.6, previous was 1.3, that is falling off a cliff. Now, mind you, this is one region. Uh, there are 12 Fed regions that each have their own, and next week I think we get two more regions uh, that are out. Uh, this is Northeast um, Philly Fed area, which is more industrial, uh, so it tends to matter more. Negative 25.6. Let's look over at uh, core PCE. This is uh, the PCE, uh, the price index from the quarter for GDP. This is just for November. Uh, 3.2, down from 3.4. The forecast was 3.3, came in lower than expected. Uh, we have uh, PCE price index uh, year over year. This is just the core year over year. The price index 2.6 uh, from 2.9. Forecast was 2.8. Uh, month over month, unchanged to 0.1. The forecast was for 0.2. It came in lower than expected. And the, the price index, month over month, this is headline. This was core. This is headline, is in deflation, uh, which means this deflationary month is disinflationary because year over year we still have inflation. But that is deflationary. The forecast was for zero. So it is coming down faster than expectations, but the U.S. has always been a leader in productivity. Uh, Canada has always had a productivity problem. I remember this going back to the uh, 80s when I was in business school, and, and we were looking at a series of, of uh, research papers uh, looking at the uh, Canadian productivity problem and why it has a productivity problem. Back then it was because we had a lack of an industrial policy. That was the big thing. What's Canada's industrial policy? We don't really talk about that much anymore, but we haven't solved uh, the productivity problem. Oh, every now and then you'll, oh, look, it looks like productivity is being solved. No, no, it hasn't. It, it, it never sustains itself. We've always had a productivity problem. Personal incomes, 0.4. Personal spending, 0.2. That is helpful for the household uh, to try to get uh, debt levels uh, uh, under control. Uh, not healthy uh, for uh, GDP on whole. Durable goods, let's look at that. 5.4. 5.4, but when we dig into the numbers, especially the more leading indicator sectors, we'll see that it's not as, it's not as robust as what we think it is, but 5.4%. Can't really argue with that. Durable goods, if you take out defense, is 6.5. How can that possibly be if you take out defense? Uh, if defense was negative, 
uh, on a seasonally adjusted basis. So if it wasn't negative, it was higher. If it was zero, then uh, it would have been lower, right? But 6.5. Uh, X uh, the non-defense goods X air 0.8 but we'll look at the uh, we'll look at the uh, report here in a second okay this is table one uh, for shipments and new orders uh, table two is for uh, unfilled orders and inventories which we don't need to look at so durable goods total and this is the column we're looking at October to November and we're gonna look at the other one September to October so look at shipments you had negative 0.8 followed by 1%. New orders, negative 5.1 followed by 5.4. So the question is, were, uh, was some of the activity from October just carried over to November? What was going on in October? Rates were going right up. November, rates were coming back down. There's also the strikes. And it wasn't just UAW. There were several strikes uh, across the U.S., so the easiest way to see if there was uh, an effect is to go down to uh, automobiles, motor vehicles and parts, negative 3.9, now 3.1, negative 4.1, now 2.8. In fact, in almost every column, you can see that it offsets. Um, total excluding transportation, you have 0.5 and 0.5. October was negative 0.2 and negative 0.3. For excluding defense, now we're taking it and we're getting rid of transportation because they can be bulky. And same with defense, can be bulky so it can distort numbers, take them all out. Negative 1.1, up 1.1. Negative 6.4, up 6.5. What we lost in one month, we got back in the other month. So a rebound in November uh, cancels the big drop we had in October. In other words, October, November, flat. So I don't know that we can get too excited about the, uh, the headline number for durable goods. It's simply just flat. The exciting part about it is that it did rebound within one month. So we could say, well, look, it rebounded within one month. That's good. It's not as if it dropped and then it only rebounded a little bit. It rebounded in one month. That's good. But let's put things in perspective. October, November, if we look over to the two months, basically flat. Um, we can look in certain categories. Uh, for some uh, some idea, C computers and electronic products. Uh, this is where you're going to get uh, semiconductors. So uh, we have 0 to 0 0.8 for shipments. That's good. Negative 0.1 to 0.3. That's pretty good. And let's go down to capital goods. And this is where you're going to find cat and deer. Uh, big products where uh, companies really don't order this stuff unless they feel good about the future. So for shipments, negative 0.3 up to 0.5, negative 14.3 up to 17.1. So if we just look at the 17, oh, sorry, that was, uh, sorry, sorry, that was uh, non-defense. Uh, shipments, uh, 0.1 up to 0.6. New orders was down 10.1 up 12.7. So if we're just looking at the 12.7, we would say, what a month. Look at what lower interest rates do. But you have to look at the month before. Negative 10 rebounded to 12.7. So over the two-month period, you have some growth there. Same with shipments. You have some growth in shipments and new orders. But overall, uh, again, going back up to the uh, excluding transportation, excluding defense, negative 6.465, negative 1.111 over the two-month period, basically flat. The only good news you can take out of this is that it did bounce back in one month. So we probably had some kind of strike effect in there, along with uh, interest rates going up uh, through the month of October, which probably put some, uh, some participants on the sidelines that then came back in December. Uh, so it's not really growth here, but a good rebound. That's the bull story in the, uh, in the durable goods. Let's have a look at the broad Equity index, S&P 500, forward four-quarter operating earnings, IBES 234.60, down from the week before on the estimate. 232.92 from SP Global, down from the week before. Closing SPX 47.54, up from the week before. So when you have your uh, numerator going up and your denominator going down, you mathematically get a PE expansion but it's not a fundamentally driven PE expansion. It is a sentiment driven PE expansion up from 20.1.
The market did print a new 52-week high last week, 474.67, ended at 473.18, all-time high, 477.60. This was the second trading day of 2022. 2022, we're coming up on the second trading day of 2024. We're only, what, four, five, six trading days away from that day, and we are 0.925% below that all-time high. Wouldn't it be wild if on the same day you printed, you beat that all-time high two years later and 550 basis points higher, you printed a new all-time high? No one would have, no one would have said that. Uh, last week we were 1.54% below an all-time high, now 0.925. That is called grinding higher. So this, this over here, see these big green bars? That's called ripping higher. Uh, grinding higher is where, you know, you're doing this kind of thing, but it's sort of just, you know, it is moving up, but no one's writing books about that, right? So it is moving up over, over time, but it's grinding higher. The week between Christmas and New Year's typically moves in the same direction as the month did. There is no economic or fundamental data. There's no company earnings and no big economic data coming out this week to derail it. As long as nothing exogenous happens, it is sentiment. The first three weeks of the month is the sentiment that carries it into the end of the year. I would expect to grind higher uh, into the end of the year. Uh, but uh, it's just, you know, we, we need fundamentals to continue to support higher and higher prices. And with uh, market uh, expectations for earnings coming down, now they're not dropping out of the sky. They're not falling off a cliff, but they're coming down. It's just, they're just going in the wrong direction. Uh, that's that can only go on for so long before you say look unless earnings start coming along you know this is it this is the best of the best the next move here would be to take profits right here because the expected return at a multiple of 21 would be extremely low because where do you go unless earnings are going to come along where would you go right 22 23 on declining earnings albeit at a slow rate it's still in the wrong direction Let's think about some tailwinds and headwinds, lower rates. Um, the Fed is saying three, the market's pricing in six, maybe seven, and it's in there. So sure, lower rates, but if you only get three rate cuts, that is lower rates, it's just not enough, it's not the same amount as the market wants. So you have to believe six to seven because that's where the market is right now. This is the price of the SPX, and we look at Fed funds futures and they're saying, okay, six to seven rate cuts. If there isn't six to seven rate cuts, then it's overpriced. Then, then the market has gone too far on this tailwind. Then it's no longer a tailwind. And I would say, given uh, where we've come from from the last meeting, uh, which was, uh, we go back to the beginning of December, somewhere around here, uh, uh, under 455 or 473, this last run up, there's your rate cuts. There's your rate cuts being priced in, I think. Lower dollar, lower DX, this helps uh, in a couple of ways. If you have a lower dollar, uh, it will give a boost to your exports because your exports appear cheaper because everyone else's currency is more expensive. It also lowers imports. And if it lowers imports, it can uh, uh, close that trade balance. And if you can close the trade balance, you can actually add to GDP just from that alone. So that could be a benefit. Um, the other benefit of a lower dollar is more of a technical uh, uh, point, uh, an accounting issue, uh, is on the income statement, uh, the currency conversion gains, not, uh, sorry, currency uh, translation gains, not currency conversion, currency translation. So most of the revenues, I shouldn't say most, over 40% of the revenues now come from outside the country. And most of the uh, S&P companies that operate globally have subsidiaries in other, in other countries to do this. So they do have subsidiaries and they do have to consolidate all of those subsidiaries. Now, wholly owned subsidiaries, but still nonetheless. Well, when you consolidate a company that operates in US with a, consult, with a company that operates in Euro, you have to translate the subsidiary's Euro income statement and balance sheet into US dollars. So you end up with translation gains and translation losses. And there's usually an account in other comprehensive income that accounts for it. Uh, depending on how it's translated, it may show up on the balance sheet or it may show up on the income statement. But uh, um, it, it, for the net income number, the headline net income, not the adjusted 
you're going to have some currency conversion gains in there with a lower dollar because the euros will buy more dollars. The pounds will buy more dollars. The Canadian uh, currency will buy more dollars. So you get this currency conversion gain. So there's a number of benefits of a lower, uh, lower dollar. AI, uh, potential AI productivity, I say potential because, well, it is the dominant narrative out there. In, in the tech space is AI. And there's two types, right? There's the generative AI and there's the predictive AI. I don't think I'm uh, saying anything controversial if I say I don't think that's there yet. Uh, I think it has a long way to go before you really find what the business model of that looks like. But the predictive uh, AI, which is very advanced predictive analytics, uh, advanced to the point that you would sort of call it, well, there is some component of AI in there, but it's certainly not generative. It's not generating new data that then becomes part of the data set. It's still using the same data, but looking at it uh, in a more, uh, quote, intelligent way. Potential, maybe, you know, uh, uh, maybe it starts to show up in income statements because it's like the story's been out there, what, uh, nine months since uh, chat GPT. Uh, changed the tone of the conversation and uh, NVIDIA backed it up. Uh, so it's been, you know, two, three quarters now. Uh, and every company rushed to say AI, AI, AI. Well, you got to start showing me uh, uh, that it's going to work out. Uh, and maybe you start to see that, some, some potential AI. Even if you don't, as long as the story is alive, you could have sentiment that pushes the multiple higher in anticipation that these earnings expectations would ratchet higher as well. So the sentiment could be well ahead of the fundamentals on this. <clears throat> uh, headwinds, limited pricing ability. If we think inflation is going to keep coming down, inflation is the price level. You can't, you can't say, oh, companies can continue to raise their prices and say inflation's coming down at the same time because when they raise their prices, that is in itself inflation. That, that, that feeds to, it is, it is the purest form of inflation. This was five bucks, now it's six bucks, that's inflation. <clears throat> you have limited uh, uh, price ability. Uh, a lot of companies have, uh, on their call have, have, you know, sort of said this as well, that we're, we're, we're having, we see, uh, you know, limited ability to pass through further increases or we're having trouble uh, passing through further increases. So the, the ability to raise prices is sort of probably at the end of that particular cycle. Now, some companies still have ability to raise prices. Others are price takers, and some of their prices are just in deflation right now. So their, their pricing power is non-existent. Uh, but when we think about the market, we can't just think, oh, I know a company that can raise prices. Yeah, probably. But we got to think about the average, the portfolio of them all limited. Labor share of national income is increasing. <clears throat> Uh, unions uh, have had uh, a great second half of 2023 uh, and probably are going to continue into 2024 uh, unionizing new shops. Uh, shops they never thought that they could get because they have this renewed power and the president that says, I'm the most pro-union president in history, in history, wants to be uh, known as that. <clears throat> I can, I can uh, pretty much guarantee you uh, that uh, in every union in America, there is a board somewhere in a room with a bunch of names of non-union shops on there and a small committee uh, that is uh, the planning committee of how do we get in there? How do we get in here? How do we get in there? The UAW, I guarantee you, has a Tesla war room figuring out strategy. To, to think that, no, they're not even looking at Tesla would be naive. I guarantee you there is a committee and a team and a room and an office somewhere with a board and, and, and pictures and little strings with pins all over it trying to figure out what's the best strategy uh, to unionize this, but they are in the crosshairs. Uh, and they're going to keep going. They haven't suffered a loss yet. They've suffered, uh, they've, they've had, I shouldn't say suffered, they've had some very public gains. Uh, and they are riding a wave of, we'll call it populist uh, popularity right now with the, with, uh, uh, the working class. I hate using the word class, but for lack of a better word, let's say that, the labor class. Uh, that's not going away, not anytime soon, not until there is a, a, a significant break in the economy where it would be unrealistic to expect the union to make gains. Now, you could say, well, if, if this goes up, uh, the investment in uh, this will just go higher. 
The higher wages are, the more motivated a company becomes to replace labor with capital. And that is true. That will happen. But it doesn't happen in 12 months. Labor has to get their gains first. And then investment starts looking at uh, uh, ways to reduce the amount of labor content that you have. But that is the end goal. Uh, uh, that has always been the end goal is if real wages, not so much just labor, but if real wages start going up, uh, capital does step in to replace labor. So these could counter each other off and cancel out, which means we lose a tailwind, uh, uh, um, um, sorry, a headwind, but you also lose a tailwind. Since lower rates are fully priced in, you've got a lower dollar, which is still there, which is kind of hard to argue against a, a, a lower dollar. Anyways, there we are for uh, the end of, well, no, it's not the end. Yes, yes it is, sorry. This is the last market outlook that pertains to 2023. Next Sunday, when I do one, we'll be looking at the first week. Well, we'll be looking back at the week that was and then looking at what's going on in the first week of 2024. But this is it. I'm going to have to update all my spreadsheets to remove the 2023 and put the 2024 in. I know last year for the first three or four weeks, somebody had to keep reminding me, you got 2022 in there. I had to go back and change it to 2023. Hopefully, I can remember it this time. Anyways, that's it, and I leave you with a sunset. Music